Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Painted in Color podcast. I'm co-host Lauren Brown, joined by co-host Mia Raujo. And today we're going to talk about self-advocacy for artists, negotiating fair pay, how to keep yourself from burning out, all of the above. But this conversation was essentially inspired and spurred by the Comics Work Me hashtag on Twitter. Um, if you haven't seen that conversation, it's worth checking out. But it's about advocating for yourself as an artist and not accepting unfair conditions and working, uh, you know, bad pay, all that stuff. So um, we start in the middle of a conversation. So come join us and check it out. Hopefully you participate in the live chat. Enjoy, everybody. Yeah, no, like when I moved back to Atlanta, uh, there's a lot of people in animation um, who have never negotiated a salary or advocated for themselves in a new way and feel guilty, like really guilty about saying, hey, I deserve to get paid more. Uh, you know, I need more money. And even when they get a pay, like pay raise or whatever, it's like not nearly anything that's significant at all. It's like a number just to appease somebody from like talking basically. Yeah. And when I've come back, after being in the game industry um, and like seeing like what people could be paid, I was like, Hey, um, you can actually make this money and you can actually negotiate not just your salary, but also the terms of your contract, like what hours you work, you can negotiate your benefits, you can negotiate anything. And they're just like, what? And I'm like, yeah, like you can really do that. Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. But I find, especially like if artists only have experienced one field or one studio, they just have no idea how to, stick up for themselves and they feel really guilty about it and feel very beholden to the company for like deigning to hire them when in reality they're likely way more talented than whatever company de like deserves from them anyway so i've been trying to tell people like hey you deserve more you realize that right like you've been doing this for how many years xyz you can get this much money working in this kind of job easy but people are scared to you know, invoke the ire of their studio, which is likely not going to happen. Or if it does, then it's probably not a good place to work at anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I get that it, it feels like somewhat of a luxury or a privilege to be able to risk losing that job. So I get that fear too, where you feel like I don't have anything else, like any other options, right? And you're like, you really need this job. So I can see how that could be really scary. And that's um same with like freelance work right where you're just like I'll just take the $500 job because I literally don't have anything else coming yeah um that's the other part of it which I completely understand but I think you're totally right I think a lot of the etiquette around not talking about your salary or how much you make really only benefits <laughs> your bosses and not not the artists you know oh 100% and that's also why they discourage artists from talking to each other about their salaries too because they don't want each other to know how much they could be making or how much you know they could be getting for any other things that they've negotiated before um and so they try to promote this kind of more competitive type of working rather than cooperative and like so that they again not having these conversations only helps the companies and not the artists mm -hmm. so these conversations are always worth having like talking like some people are really uncomfortable talking numbers I, I like to talk numbers because I like to let people know, like, here's what is is, is possible. Here's what's out there. Um, you know, I even started, I started to share my numbers on um, a discord that I had, like for like, you know, like it was people who go to conventions and artists and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, here's my report from this convention. Here's how much I made. Here's how much I spent, you know, like breaking everything down to let people know, like, it's not for people to feel jealous or guilty or weird about it, but it's to inform and let people know it's like this is like what you could be making some people are probably making more than me some people are probably making less than me but here's where i land and it encouraged the conversation to, to have other people start to open up and share their numbers and also share tips and tricks on what they did in order to increase those numbers or what did work or did, what didn't work it created a whole conversation that ended up helping people understand what they could do better next time so you know i really am a firm believer of like talking that kind of stuff through to know this is what I'm actually worth and maybe there's something out there that could give me that it could be possible though this is a hard landscape to be doing it but it's I mean it's worth always it's always worth the fight because yeah. the worst somebody can say is no and if a studio punishes you for it like I don't know they're not worth working for but in my experiences most studios don't even punish you for it they're just like we can't do that and they keep it moving yeah 
Yeah. Do you think for you it, it took um like knowing what you're worth? Like I think in the beginning there there's a moment before where you don't know. And what what was that moment for you? Like what was that? Change oh, that's a good question. So it was when actually I was working in animation and applying to work in games. Um because I think I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, I was making hourly. Um, it was not a good salary uh, or not a good rate, I guess, uh, for animation. And I applied to EA and EA was like, well, here's uh, what we can offer you. And when I saw the number, I was like, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. And like, and then I was like talking frantically to my friend who worked there. And I was like, what, what, what should I say? Like, should I counter offer with something? And he was like, yeah, you totally should counter offer with something. I'm like, really? But that's already so much. And he was like, no, he was like, just say the number that like aim for a number a little bit higher than what you're looking for, like $5,000 higher. And then they'll probably land on where, you know, if you have a number in your mind, it's probably, that's probably where they're going to land. And I did that. And you know what they did? They landed exactly where he said they were going to. Wow. Way more money than I'd ever made in my entire life. And all it took was just taking, first off, taking a leap to just see what, what else was out there. Cause um, you know, I'd never worked in games before, but I had experience of like leadership. I had animation experience. Um, you know, I had mentorship experience. And so all the things that they were looking for, I had aside from working in games itself. And so, you know, I was like, okay, I might as well apply because there was nothing to lose. If I don't get the job, I still have a job, which is the best position to be in. I like, <laughs> this is, I mean, it's not going to sound like anything. This is like a thing that everybody should do if they work in studio jobs. Um, if you are like, even if you're not necessarily looking to move jobs, it is good to see what is out there. It's good to see what kind of salaries are like offered. Um, if you are like thinking about moving, it's good to apply for places, even if you're like not sure if you want to leave yet, just to see what they offer you and to see if it's like, you know, a rate that's going to be more. And at, at the very least, what it does is it helps keep your interview skills sharp. It helps you understand what people could offer you if you're not getting paid enough. And it helps you understand that you are desirable elsewhere so that you are still like a person who is like able to be in other jobs if anything happens to your main job. Because I'll tell you one thing, studio job, like, no, I feel like no job is secure, especially in this climate. No job is secure. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. I think, the past of like the 20, 30 year career. Like that, that is a dream. That does <laughs> like, right not now. happen anymore. And it's really sad. It like is. there's people who have been at studios for like 15 years, but unfortunately now they're in the minority um most people you know have to either jump around jobs or end up getting laid off from somewhere or fired from somewhere and like are left with just like oh what do I do now um you know so I'm always I've always been the type of person who's had backup plans upon backup plans just in case the rug has been pulled out for, would be pulled out from under me because I even even when I was younger I always had a feeling I was like Anything could happen to me, so I might as well have all these backup options just so I can make income and don't fall flat if this happens. Yeah. And it did happen. And it worked out because I activated all my backup plans at once. That was a bit much, but it's worth having a plan and knowing that you can work elsewhere. Because I think like oftentimes when you've been in a job for a long time, you just don't really get a sense of anything else is out there. Your world becomes very small and it kind of helps your world to get a little bit bigger, realizing that like there's more out there than just the one place that you've worked out. Definitely. And even that even applies to independent artists because back when I was doing gallery work only, it didn't even occur to me that I could do conventions when another fellow gallery artist was like, I'm doing them you should do it too. And at first I was like, no, this is not my thing. I couldn't possibly sell here. And he was like, yes, you can. I thought the same thing, you know? Um, and same with illustration or whatever it is, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that's, that applies to studio artists and self-employed artists. Absolutely. And, and it can be scary, but I think that in my case, it took somebody else or someone from my community telling me that I could do that on my own. I would not have come up with that, you know? Completely. Yeah. So I, I was wondering when you decided to switch to to games, did was it 
did you feel like you you needed people to sort of from the inside to sort of welcome you in or to, to be like you can do this too 100 <laughs> percent. i would like i would have never thought about it ever in my in my life thought about that specific studio and that specific location if my friend hadn't left a year before and started working there and he reached out to me when they started posting jobs and they was like hey just saw a position that you might want to apply for i think you would be a good fit for it and mm -hmm. that's all it took and I was like, oh, like, I've never worked in games before. He was like, oh, that doesn't matter. He's like, you would learn the job in like two months, like not even. And I learned in like a month and a half. So, but it took somebody to reach out to me and tell me, hey, I think you would be good for this. I think you are qualified to like uplift and encourage and like support throughout the way. Because again, I wouldn't have known to negotiate my salary. Or I wouldn't even have known what I should be getting paid until he let me know. It's like, hey, this is the general rate that they give your your this this career field and I was like what and he was like yeah like so you ask for this and I was like okay okay I was gonna ask for so much less I had no I had no sense like uh, at all of like what I could have been getting paid so um yeah it, he really helped me a lot like he you know he made sure that like I knew everything that I needed to know um you know when I got in and you know it's not like he got me into the studio like I still had to interview and go through the whole process but he was the one who encouraged me every step of the way. And I needed that encouragement because I didn't know, um, you know, if I was, if, if I was good enough or qualified or ready. Um, but all I knew is that I, I had a general sense that I wanted to leave my current job and wanted to go somewhere else, but I had no idea what that even was. And then I found out. Yeah. So yeah, it often takes somebody to uplift and encourage. So yeah, for people listening, um, if you are in the position to help your friends get out of a bad place or a place that is exploiting them, a place that is underpaying them, or even if they just don't like their job and you know that there's better out there for them, just like take a second to encourage them and let them know. It's like, Hey, I saw some, I saw a job listing that you probably would be a good fit for. You should have consider it because oftentimes they're going to be like, no, like I'm fine where I'm at. You know, artists, you know how we are. <laughs> <laughs> no I think I just don't want to make waves I just I just don't want and just say like just do it just do it and see what happens the worst they could say is no yeah. and usually that like helps them kind of get out of their shell and be like okay I guess I'll try it and oftentimes it's crazy how it works out yeah results that you may never expect absolutely yeah what do you do though when like the industry you're passionate about and you're like I want to do this is just terrible practices terrible pay no reform whatsoever in years maybe the the wages or salaries going down actually from a couple decades past like <laughs> oh we do it for the passion no we don't we have to live and eat <laughs> it, well it could be yes i mean we do it we do it for the passion as well yeah but we also have to live and eat as a reality and i think that people think about doing it for the passion so much that they don't think they deserve to advocate for themselves yeah. like i mean i really i mean i love animation i love games like i adore both fields but what was the question like i i was about to get on the soapbox and i was like wait i need to answer what you asked first <laughs> no it's just, i guess just like what do you do when the industry you're wanting to work in actually is not like that has a ceiling in terms of like they're never going to pay you what you actually deserve you know because i mean for for all the there are some like tabletop gaming, you know, rates I've taken that are definitely below a lot of people in the gaming industries, you know, limit what they would possibly take as their lowest barrier, but that's way higher than the comics industry, you know? So it's just like there for every industry that you're like, that is underpaid. There's another one that's even less well-paid. Oh, and, 100%. And like, what do you do? If, like, I just want to make comics for instance, but the industry is in deep need of overhaul but it's not going to happen now and hopefully mm. it will happen but it's not happening in the present like yeah it's it's tricky because this is really a case-by-case -case individual basis because it's like out like it's weighing how much you really believe in working for this career and how much you can actually survive off of working in this career and also how much how long is my health going to hold up working in this career because comics in particular is crazy and the like probably some of the hardest working people i've ever met 
and probably some of the lowest paid for the most part. And a lot of people stay in it because they just love it so much and they they're dedicated to it. They cannot imagine themselves doing anything else. But the way I live, which is not the way that everybody else lives and not the way everybody else can live, is that there's always a way to diversify your income so that you don't have to rely on one fledgling thing to be your whole life support. But with comics, it's so time consuming and it's so much work for one job that I think one, one of my friends got offered a $25 a page rate. Like how's like, that legal? <laughs> actually also I got offered a $25 a, dollar a page page rate back in the day. And I was just like looking at it like, I don't think I can live off of that. I can't do this. And it's like, I wanted to, I've always wanted to do comics um, and I have done comics before, but that rate, I was just like this, I, I can't do Cause like 30 pages. So you're just going to be suffering for no money, yeah. but so many people take it. Yeah. So many people work for those rates. And we'll be doing penciling, inking, coloring, lettering, like everything for really, really low page rates. And they'll stick with it because they're like, well, I want to make stories. Like their main goal in life is to make stories and to make comics. Yeah. And they feel dedicated enough to stick with it. But I mean, that is up to them. And I can't take that away from them because again, they're hardworking. They are, they love the craft. They, you know, they're, they're probably masters at what they do because in comics, you have to know every single aspect of art making. You have to know perspective and anatomy and props and like everything act character acting panel layout graphic design everything and it just doesn't support them unless they are a big name in the industry yeah. and, and so in the industry do get paid a livable wage they're the only ones who do <laughs> they deserve to get paid a oh my god everybody deserves to get paid a, a livable wage especially what like you just, they just deserve that but if the industry is not able to cough up the funds then it's just like what do you do like you can't you can't think that you alone is going to reform it but i feel like as long as people continue to speak out about this we can create change by having a community once again community is a big key factor in this have people you can lean on who can either recommend better jobs for you or something that is adjacent to what you're doing or you're making your own book somehow, um, or you stick with what you're doing and you decide that you can live off of the small wage or the, you know, the wage that you're getting, um, which again, I can't take that away from anybody, but I, I always just recommend like, Hey, find out where else you can use these skills that can give you some more money that will not destroy your physical and mental health. You know, like you need your, your hands and your wrists. So many, so many of my artist friends have been sick, carpal tunnel, a lot of webcomic artists that I follow actually really like oftentimes have to take extended breaks or are in the hospital for something or in the doctor. Um, you know, it really takes a toll. It takes a huge toll working in comics or working in any art industry that is like intensive and high production. But I feel like comics is, has been one of the worst. And so... I would just explore options that are out there if you're really like rethinking like hey like is this career right for me it's like it could be right for you but the pay could not be right and that's okay too yeah. like you're not a bad person for wanting money mm -hmm. i think a lot of artists find themselves they're like oh like i i can't ask for this because i'm making art i think the problem is is that people have devalued art for so long that they've made it seem like, oh, you're just doing it for passion. So I can, you can do this for exposure. Yeah. Or like <laughs> that, that some of the, even the bosses say that same thing where it's just like, you should be happy to do this for a living. You should be so grateful. And it's you just should like, be so grateful. Hey, gratitude does not pay my bills. Like I still have to eat. Like what the hell? I have heard that <laughs> before when I was in animation. You should be yeah. so grateful that you get to work. So many people want this job that you're in right now. Yeah. And that's that that guilt tripping and that sort of gaslighting is because they know they're exploiting you and they they know they don't have a leg to stand on. They don't want you to advocate for yourself. So they say they, they tell you those things. 
and sure people want to work there and then they work there and they realize like oh <laughs> <laughs> or they don't and you know that happens too yeah but I think that we really need to learn how to speak up for ourselves and how to at least ask for better how to at least negotiate something something yeah. but you can negotiate everything yeah. what about you like what would you do Mia, if like, you know, I mean, what would, like, what would you, how would you approach this problem? Because I, I have one way of thinking. I mean, I think that sometimes you can't plan for the perfect outcome, you know, and that, that's certainly my situation. Like if I could have done it my way, if the pandemic hadn't happened when it did, <laughs> I would have kept working my day job and saved up money. And then when I could afford to quit that job and then knowing how little publishing pays. And again, publishing pays way more than comics, but it's still not a livable wage. Like most people think you're getting a book published, you're set for life. And it's like, it's only the beginning. It's like the long game for any for a lot of these industries, you know, like you, you know, your first project is not it, you know, it's like, and it takes a so long to get that first project, you know? So it's yeah. just, it's exhausting. And, it, but I think for me, it's, it's self-awareness or it's just at least awareness and knowledge is the thing that is, is, is the power that you have. And, and then you can plan around it. Again, my plan would have been to, to save up working a day job that is not art, but even that has its consequences. Like I was starting to get carpal tunnel towards the end because I'm carrying heavy ass trays with a bunch of, you know, uh, glass glassware on there. So I'm not drawing, but I'm still messing up my wrists, you know, mm -hmm. so there there's, you know, good and bad to everything, I guess. Um, and there's no like bulletproof solution, but what you were saying about diversifying your income is definitely where I would go about it. And if it's an industry that pays really little, I would just look at that as any self-employed artist or any independent artist where your, your wage is probably going to be a lot lower than most people who work at studios and you're not going to have paid time off. You're not going to have health insurance. You're not going to have benefits, 401k, you have none of that. So you kind of have to see like you said where do your skills take you is it starting a patreon is it opening a like a tip jar on coffee or whatever like you, you know being more present on social media all things that again depend on the individual because i'm not great at some of those things myself but, <laughs> i'm not either yeah and some of that stuff takes time right so it's like i hadn't planned to go into to do conventions but that helped as well it's like building your audience um with things like conventions online or, or patreon helps and then those things kind of like almost like cushion the, the unwise decision to take a bad pay, you know, but yeah. again, going in with awareness and, and knowing where you're going to end up by taking that job helps you then make, you know, maybe better decisions for yourself or like living in a less expensive state. If I could do that, if my partner didn't work here in California, I get the hell out of here, you know, <laughs> <So> <laughs> things like that. Like that's Bird. <laughs> But, um, but again, easier said than done. Cause all the stuff never really lines up neatly with your life when you need to, you know, nope. you might be a caregiver that you're like your, your parent or whoever it is you're taking care of lives in that state, you know, involved mm -hmm. uprooting them too. And, and so I'm saying all that with caveats, knowing that everybody's situations are different and yeah. And yeah, it's like, you might have family. families, you might have children, you might have, um, you know, you might have like a disability. You might have like, there's so many different things that you could have that stop you. Yeah. from being able to live the life that you want to live in the way that you think that you want to live it yeah and it sucks too because all the solutions that we propose are technically doing more work yeah yeah they are it's which not, is such a bummer job it's like you're not doing five to do the one you know yeah exactly <laughs> to set yourself up but the one doesn't work out it's like this, yeah. I was like yeah. oh this sucks but yeah. this is the society that has been set up for us. Like in order to survive, we have to work to make money to then turn in money to the economy to like give, it's like, uh capitalism. Capitalism yeah. is always the problem. <laughs> we can say that as much as we want to, but like that's the society that we live in. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, my, my best, biggest ideal solution would be to reform it in some way or another to create protections for artists to make sure that we actually have some kind of uh community and idea that can like like actually secure a better wage for us freelance or studio um you know like to be able to advocate for ourselves and to advocate for each other and to have a rule set like hey like contractually you cannot treat me like this contractually you cannot pay me this low contractually you have to pay me timely manner and not make me wait a year yeah. in order to get my paycheck. Yeah. 
like if that would be that would be my ideal world where artists could actually get a livable wage and actually have rule sets for us to work in like the music industry does yeah and right now we just don't because i feel like we're so scattered and we're so independent and we're so encouraged to be in our silo that a lot of artists underestimate the value of community and the value of having people who can vouch for you and advocate for you and uplift you when you don't think that you're good enough to do anything for yourself uh to like raise yourself up in a better position yeah and the sad thing is too that it's like it's all moving faster and faster and getting more and more work out of us you know it's like the the fact that we're probably working as much as our parents but making a lot less compared to what we need to pay our bills it's not getting better you know it's like not. all this technology all these things that are making more opportunities for us is actually making us work harder and longer and for less and it's just yeah because everything is accessible now and now you know i've it's it's kind of bleak but like this is this is why the natural the natural conclusion of the progression was getting to AI because yeah. people just want stuff from us all the time <laughs> and they want it done yesterday all the time yeah and, and now they can get a crappy simulation of like oh here's the thing that I wanted from this artist yeah. stolen from another artist <laughs> or <laughs> many other artists yeah yeah and again the sad thing is about that is that We've, we've always been told, I think more so in the last 10 years, what does your audience want? Connect with your audience. And I don't, so there's, I think that's two things. There's, there's a way to connect with your audience doing what you do and like letting your audience find you. But then there's the other part where it's like, what does your audience want? And that's mm -hmm. what you should do. And unfortunately, I think that has trained a lot of people into the feeling like I should get to dictate what I see and what content I get. And that is, I should be catered to. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, no, you don't, sometimes you don't know what you want and that's okay. And you get to discover something that's really cool that you never would have thought of and you connect with. And that's another part. It doesn't always have to be a predictable outcome, which is where we're at. It seems like that's the only place we're at. And then when something does kind of break the mold, everyone's so surprised. Like, how does this work? Yeah. We never saw this coming. It's like, cause you're <laughs> always trying to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. And you will only get the same thing if that's all you expect. Like, exactly. and that's again, like that's all AI can do is the same thing because it only rehashes as an invent. And like, um, I think I talked to you over Discord about this, but when, when I watched Spider-Verse, uh, Across the Spider-Verse, I like just cried at the end, like at seeing this feat of human artistic achievement, human artistic achievement of what we can do when we think we can do more, we can achieve more, we can create something truly amazing that no one has seen. And they did and they pulled it off excellently and i was just like this is this is the future that i want yeah. this is the kind of thing that i want to see are people breaking the mold over and over over again because if we only have ai ai can't do that we're only going to get the same thing rehashed over and over and over again it's going to be soulless and it's going to be nothing and this is what happens when you let artists fly and i'm sure you know I'm sure they had a tough time making that movie. I, I feel like all movies are a tough time to make it. Absolutely. But I saw the art that concept artists had been making. Like people have been sharing the work that they've done for the movie. And they got to explore their strength. They got to explore their mind and put that out for, for the studio to appreciate and like, you know, and funnel up to the final product. But seeing that pure expression in such a beautiful way, our very own Brie. Our Brie, yes, Brie was a part of that. <laughs> Go look at her stuff because, like, seriously, yeah. beautiful work. The yeah. fashions, ah, oh, oh, so fantastic. Chris Anka, I saw sharing uh, his stuff. Um, I mean, uh, Evening Monteros uh, worked on that movie too. Amazing work. Yeah. Uh, it was. I mean, so many people who I admire and love. Anyway, yeah. go look at their art. It's fantastic. I'm going on a tangent, but it's worth it because that movie was amazing and was so good. Oh, God. The, the passion like radiated off the screen like I don't mean to sound cheesy but very few movies make me feel that way especially Same. like and, and animated films today where it just feels like there's a formula that just a lot of people trying to do and this just felt like just blasting with like just passion and everyone on there was like on their a-game and just giving their all and yes it was probably hard grueling work but I can't even imagine how proud they felt watching that because I was crying in the credits too and it was like <laughs> I was not ashamed product. I was just like same 
I was just like, look at all these names of these amazing people. And they all, they're, they're just, it, it's an industry that is underappreciated, underpaid compared to other or like film uh, medium. And it's just like, it's not fair because it should be, it should be best, a best picture contender. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It was like, yes, the most memorable film I've seen so far. So honestly, go see it if you need motivation right now, because it really inspired me. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, the culmination of all that work from, you know, people, it, it was, it really moved me. It moved me like to my core. And the first movie did too. I think yeah. I sobbed like at the first movie as well. I always cry when I'm moved. Yeah, so just ignore that. <laughs> but like, I was just like, wow, like people really came together and just left it all on the screen. Like they just like, they put it there and they're like, you're going to appreciate this. Yeah. And nobody was asking for it, but here it is. And now you're asking for it. Yeah. Now you want more because we've shown you, we created this thing that we believed in. Here it is. Do you like it? And everybody said, yes, we want more of this. Yeah. And that is how you also lead your personal presence as well. Like that's the, I, I know there's some people who have a business out of doing what their audience is asking them to do. But even with that, they have shown what their style is. They've shown what kind of things they, they prefer to draw. Um, you know, they've shown what their strengths are and then the audience is like yes we want more of these strengths like can you please do this for us and you know sometimes the artist says yes and caters to that audience but that's after they built it yeah i think a lot of people spend time chasing what mm -hmm. they think an audience wants and they lose themselves stylistically or they just lose themselves in that chase and they're like why can't i get any engagement it's like oftentimes because the work is all over the place because you don't know you don't you you need to know what you want to make yeah and you have a, a strong enough sense of what your, you know, your art is or your sense of self to make it and make it, you know, you work on it to make it good. And then you, you put it out there in the world and let people come to you. And that's hard. That's scary. It's really scary. It's and you really make a good scary. point, a good distinction that there's some people that happen to do exactly what their audience wants and it's exactly what they love to do. I think it's very rare. <laughs> like it's very, a very rare, very narrow slice of people who, who get to have that sort of just hang into place especially from the beginning um so i'm not trying to imply that people that have been following what their audience wants are are, are faking it out in some way because there it is possible to be gen absolutely genuine and that aligns for them but yeah. a lot of people it is the temptation to follow what the audience wants is greater than finding their own voice because i don't know we all have different paths in terms of self-acceptance too right in terms of like trying to deny the things we really are because we're ashamed of them or because we're running away from them or because we haven't healed properly from things. And, and for artists that all that stuff is very raw and, yes. and then there's the need to pay the bills. And so I understand why it doesn't come together at times as well. So don't beat yourself up if you haven't found that yet. It's just, it's patience, you know, like that. I think that's the number one thing you need as an artist is just patience. It's patience. And, and I guess that's the other piece I would add to like, if you are like really passionate about an industry that's either obsolete, like animation, hand-drawn animation was for the longest time. And yet I'm still seeing people making their own hand-drawn films and, and funding them and Kickstarter and things like that, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes I wonder, cause I, sorry, this is a slight tangent, but when I started art school, like 2D was dead. And I was like, I guess I can't pursue that. But there's some other people who were my same age and younger and said, I'm still going to pursue that. You no know? matter what. Yeah. And it's like, I find that amazing that it's like you can you can make that work but I guess the other thing is is like it might not work right away it might work for them in 10 years and, yeah. and that, that again comes with just self-awareness of knowing I still want to pursue this thing that's either obsolete or pays like crap but I'm not going to expect it to take off right away from me it's going to be a journey it's going to take five ten years maybe am 100%. I willing to do that you know yeah and how will I pay the bills to get there and all that stuff so it's just like just about being real with yourself at every moment. What are my priorities right now? What's my end goal? If I if I just really want to work in this industry that just doesn't pay well, how do I make it happen for myself without killing myself in the process? You know, that's the biggest question. Because yeah, like again, that's why I don't want to take that career path away from anybody. Because I know that there's like you know the people who are in comics, they love comics. They mm -hmm. they live and breathe comics like very often. The ones who really stick with it and even like regardless of the fact that it doesn't pay well and regardless of the fact that they have to work so many hours on this thing to make it you know to to finish and you know i i still know people who i went to school with 12 years ago who still haven't been able to get 
traction or an audience for their work, but they're still making their work because they love making their work. And I admire them for that because that's hard to stick with when you know that, hey, I don't know who the per- who the person is who's supposed to be looking at this, but somebody's going to see this. Yeah. And this is worth sharing because someone's going to see it. And I'm like, that is awesome. But I want you to also live as long as you're living and not, I just don't want people to destroy themselves as well because nobody can receive your work if you can't make it anymore if you have if you have injured yourself if you're physically incapable if you burned yourself out you can't put that work in the world anymore so as you are passionate you also just pace yourself vary it up if you know that comics isn't going to pay the bills then there is also no shame in doing a day job that is whatever and going home at night and doing the thing that you're excited and passionate about. That is totally okay. There's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that. As long as you have energy left over to do that. Yeah. And there's some jobs who do not require any of your creative brain power at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's hard. I mean, see, being on the sidelines of your career, what you thought your path would be, and watching everyone else race ahead and kind of get make the money, pay, you know, get the collectors, whatever it is, the industry you're in, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's discouraging. It's really hard. And you feel like you question yourself every day. Did I make the right choice? Did I fail? Whatever. So I'm not trying to like romanticize that either because it is incredible. No, it's difficult. not. Um, yeah. But the thing that kind of kept me going is like, if what you're making is something that you love and if, and, and people will ultimately, people will ultimately connect with it but there's no rush to get there. It doesn't matter if it happens now or in 10 years, it will still connect. And you just have to trust that. There's no guarantee of that, of course, but I think that that sort of uh, sense of, uh, I, it's not sense of urgency, it was the other one that's like immediate instant gratification. Yes. All like really have been tempered to feel like lately is is what I think kind of um, sabotages you sometimes where and that's why I brought up patience that it's like sometimes it's like knowing that I I might have to ride this out a lot longer than I would like but it's still going to be worth it when you get there you just have to believe that and I don't have any proof of that that it will pay off I mean I do have some proof like on the way you do you definitely do (laughs) so so it's like you just have to believe me like take my word for it but I'm just saying like it's it's going to be it's really satisfying even if it's taken so long to then finally get to the end and on the way it's gonna suck and that's all I can say about that I guess yeah yeah it is it's it is a difficult journey especially when you do like oftentimes it's like especially when you've gone to art school yeah and you have compared yourself to your peers for as long as you remember because that's what art school makes you do and you see your peers doing whatever with their career and you haven't quite gotten to where you wanted to go yet um it is really hard to have the patience and to keep that energy and you're going to feel like you're failing. You're going to feel discouraged. You're going to feel depressed about it. And you're not going to feel, you might some, at some points feel unmotivated to do what you, what you think you should be doing or what you need to be doing or whatever that is. Um, And I think in those moments, once again, it's good to talk to somebody who can help you get out of that rut um especially if you've gone to art school like usually you've met somebody who's like capable of getting you out of that head that headspace i definitely have a few people who can do that for me because there's like even like even though i'm a studio artist and everything i still have those moments of like what am i even doing like i make a piece of art and i'm like did i even make anything like what is this and that's when i like message one of my friends and i'm like hey can you just like look at look at this for me and like let me know what I can do better or like tell me that this is anything? And usually that friend would be like, "This is awesome! Like, what are you talking about?" And they give me a critique because they're good friends. And they're like, "Oh, all you did is fix this and that." And I'm like, "Okay, like, I'm not, I'm not awful. I'm not the worst thing in the world. I'm not failing. It's okay." But getting stuck in your own head is very very easy to do when you're an artist because again, our work is made mostly alone. If you are independent or you're doing comics alone, or, you know, or what, even if you're working from home and you're not around people, uh, it's very easy to feel isolated. Um, but there is a huge community out there and I cannot, like, I keep saying it. I know I keep repeating myself, but I cannot recommend it enough to lean on your fellow artists because guaranteed 
at least one of us has felt the same way that you have. One of us felt like we were failing. Mm -hmm. One of us felt like we couldn't advocate for ourselves. One of us had imposter syndrome. One of us felt depressed. One of us felt anxious. One of us just felt like we couldn't focus. No, unmotivated. Any of these things is a very common art experience. There's somebody who can bounce that off of you and be like, I felt like this, but I got out of it. Yeah. Let that happen for yourself because I guarantee it'll make you feel so much better. But yeah, there's no one size fits all for everybody. That's just like, everybody's an individual, you know? Um, you may not feel like anybody's out there. I know a lot, oftentimes there's this really fun form of self-sabotage where you just don't reach out to anybody, even if you know there's people out there. Mm -hmm. I've done that before. I'm like, oh, I can't bother them. They're doing their thing. They're probably busy. I guess I'll just suffer through this alone. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's so familiar. <laughs> so recent. It's so recent. Like you're just like in my head right now. <laughs> and it's like you feel like I don't want to stress. I don't want to be like the person that every time I talk to my this friend, like I'm always complaining or I'm always like anxious, and and that's all I become to them. So then you just don't reach out, and then and then they reach out and then you're like and then they're, they're basically saying i've been through this too and you're just like oh god why didn't i reach out before <laughs> everything could have been solved if i just asked my friend <laughs> <laughs> and i'll tell you one thing too as you reach out to your friends and activate your network again and just to, just to talk to your friends having that connection and conversation can ultimately also lead to a better career because they are thinking about you you are now top of mind because you have reached out. So if they see something that you could be a good fit for, if they see a job that has come by, if they see that, you know, they, you know, they know they're struggling with something and there's like an opportunity, a grant, a mentorship, you are top of mind now in their head. It is more likely that you get recommended for something that could elevate your career. You could get recommended for somebody who could notice your work. There's like, you can be out in the world from activating that community so you don't have to just suffer through it. You can be doing your thing and then head into a windfall just because you've talked to a friend. Yeah. Like it's crazy how those chance moments in art can really lead to a complete shift in career. Like I said, like my one friend who just like reached out to me because he knew I was good to work with because he worked for me before changed my entire traje trajectory of my career. It's like you could be that one friend for somebody else or that one friend could be that somebody for you, but your friends like helping you. And here's the thing that I have been really bad at is asking for help. Yes. High five. Because I'm bad at it too. Ask for help. <laughs> what are we doing? What are we doing? It's, you can't do it alone. That's the thing. It's like this artist myth that you're you're just the solitary genius in the studio making everything yourself. And if you're not, then you're not actually an artist. And that's not true. Like every, like honestly, it's like every artist that that makes anything wor worthwhile is about connecting with people. And so they might not talk about it often, but they have people in their lives. They have loved ones. They have friends. Even if they're not physically helping them make their work or whatever, they're helping them by Get, taking their mind off of stress or by taking them out of their studio so they're not just staring at that piece of paper all day or whatever it is and uh I literally crashed this last month just from this just like holding myself up in here and it was it was the punch in the face I needed that it's just like you cannot do this yourself you cannot work every day and have it not affect your mental health and your productivity mm -hmm. even like it I was not more productive because I was working every single day um so anyway uh yeah. but I, but to the point of like reaching out to people, I think the other part is just looking for any kind of refuel of your energy and your motivation in whatever form that is. And um, sometimes for some people, it's like a change of scenery, but but also just like we were talking about with the Spider-Man movie, like seeing something that just makes you feel alive. Remember why you wanted to do this thing, you know? Refill the well. Yes, yes. Any way, any way you can or any way that works for you. But it's like... That is so important because you kind of can't create from nothing, you know? Yes. Hey, friends. Anybody playing Tears of the Kingdom? <laughs> hey, guess what? It's okay to play it. It's okay <laughs> to spend hours playing it. Don't feel guilty for playing hours of Tears of the Kingdom because you know what you're doing? You're refilling your well. That's right. Because that game is an experience. How fun is that? Then you get to go back to your art and be like, wow, I feel ready to make art. <laughs> 
Absolutely. I played Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> Especially if you're in a hard part of like your art project or whatever it is, it's just hard. It's not fun at that point. You need something to counterbalance that, like bring some happiness into the fold, you know, so that you feel like, okay, I got a reward for for doing this really hard work, you know? Yep. So it doesn't have to be art all the time. <laughs> no, it really, it, and it, sh it can't be art all the time. It, can't be. <laughs> it really can't be art all the time. Like you have some, you have to have something that feeds into the art. So what's that going to be? Go touch grass. Go play the video game. Go watch the cool show or go watch the cool movie. Hang out with your friends. Hang out with your family. Look at literally anything else but your screen or your, your you know, canvas. Look at something that is not art for yeah. a second. Because yeah. it can all funnel back into the experience. Let yourself be a person. Yeah. My God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to butcher his name because I don't actually know how to pronounce it, but, uh, but Jesper Ising. The oh, I love, I love that artist. I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm sorry. I know. I'm sorry too. Amazing. <laughs> but I absolutely love his bird pictures. Like he just goes out and takes pictures of birds because that's clearly an obsession of his and it's amazing. And I'm sure that awesome. that is in his paintings. Like every one of his paintings of birds is awesome. And it's inspired by that hobby of his, you know, and it just shows another side of him that everybody else is like, I never knew you like birds. It's so yeah. cool. <laughs> Well, I mean, literally, um, like just like this week, I was like, you know what? I need to get out of the house. So I'm going to get out of the house. Uh, I'm going to walk on the trail or whatever um, and just like just let myself walk and be outside like and go to a co-working space. So I'm not working at home. Fine. Cool. As I was walking on the trail, I saw that uh, one of the breweries because it's like, you know, we have a whole Beltline thing. The breweries are connected to it. It's pretty cool. Uh, Atlanta. We're dope. Um <laughs> They have a garden uh, behind their brewery, and that garden was full of different varieties of pitcher plants. And I was just like, and like immediately like ran into it and took pictures and like reference. And they were blooming too, so they had weird flowers that were like big bulbs. And um, and I like took close ups and like reference photos and saw like bees flying around it and like flies and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is great. And now I'm designing a new queen because I saw that. Because guess what? Went out, touch grass now I'm making art it converted it into art isn't that useful <laughs> I also forced myself to run unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> I mean movement is is amazing and it's like I I'm terrible at working out but I've been just 20 minutes every like four days five days a week and it's just made such a difference from like a month ago where I was just like in this just depressive hole you know and it's just yeah it's just anything that refuels your energy your like look up how your brain works like there's plenty of videos on youtube and things like that just like just try to understand how your brain gets rewarded whether you have adhd or your neuronormative whatever it is just figure mm -hmm. it out and or you know look more into it so that you can understand have control your over how your uh, productivity goes i guess or or lack of productivity because that's important too <laughs> yeah mia how do you break yourself out of depressive slumps I mean, it, I feel like I have to hit a wall before, <laughs> uh, before I go anywhere. So my wall was insomnia. <laughs> oh, no. And, and it took that realizing, like, this is really wrong. Like, this is not right. This is not something I've ever dealt with. Um, so it, unfortunately for me, I, I think it does take something drastic like that, where I'm just like, this is clearly not normal. Because it, in my head, I'm just like, I don't have time. So I have to work every day. I don't have another option. And I think just over just trying to get my sleep back to, to normal was just just trying to take all the healthiest steps I could, whether it was trying to tire myself out with exercise or trying to relax myself before going to sleep to so doing more meditation and stuff like that. So it was really about trying to solve that problem that then extended to realizing I actually need at least one day off every week where I just don't put anything on my schedule, not even like check emails. It's like nothing on that day. And in fact, that was not enough. I then realized if I just stayed around my house for a day, I would wind up in the studio and want to work. So I had to leave my house. So yeah. I just, uh, I think just over the last few weeks, just forcing myself to be out of the house or if I was having a bad mental health day, I actually took that uh, advice from Victoria Ying when she uh, did a talk and she was showing that she was recording every single day on her project, good mental health day, bad mental health day. And she was getting a visual of how many days were green or red. So oh, wow really brilliant but I started actually doing that and seeing how many days of my week were bad mental health days but try not to fight it so I think for a few weeks instead of trying to force myself to be productive on the days that I just wasn't feeling well I would actually allow myself to just do something else whether that was read a book or 
go take a walk or whatever and just try not to think about how little I had done that day because it was not going to help me feel better about it, you know, but it took time. And, and the irony of it is before this happened, my therapist was telling me I needed to take four days off at least maybe two weeks if I could. And I was like, I cannot afford that. And I ended up taking that time off anyway, because I wasn't productive on those days because I had burnt out, you know? So (laughs) sometimes the thing you think you cannot possibly afford to do is exactly the thing you should do. Yeah. (laughs) And the whole time your mind was telling you that there's a problem. Yeah. And it was going to force you to stop no matter if you wanted to or not. Yeah. Yeah. And I was yeah. ignoring it and then feeling bad about ignoring it. And then it would just get worse. And it's just, yeah, so when you, if you could have the, the moment of awareness where you realize that this is happening. And, and for me, I just didn't st- slow down enough to realize it was happening. But I think that's part of what meditation is about is training yourself to slow down more often. So you can catch yourself in those moments, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, I'm not good at it. <laughs> So. Yeah, I it's, it's it's I feel like everybody is like working at it in some capacity or another. Like I feel like nobody has it down to a complete science because our minds are unpredictable sometimes. And you know, you cope with it the best way you know how. Um and then you find new things that go wrong and you're like, "Well, now I have to adjust for this too." And now I have to learn a new thing about myself. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's the adjustment and how well you adjust to your own tendencies that like is really the measure of you know how much you can keep how sustainable it is that is like working how you work with how your brain works um you have to know what to do you have to learn what to do when things go wrong or when things get hard and bad so for what i do um if i'm feeling like really depressed uh or just like in my slump because there's some days there's like some days where i feel like unmotivated and i just can't do anything or move myself to do anything especially when I know I need to do something like I I have to draw or I have to like, I can't stare at the screen of my phone doom scrolling on social media. Like this just can't happen tonight. So what I had done, one of the things that I had done was I kept a list on my computer. um, And the list was just all the things that shake me out of that slump. Like for example, just browse art on Pinterest. That always like makes cheers me up. Um, Go outside, like, like sit and like, just enjoy the breeze. Like go take a walk um you know play with kitties and like actually like you know play like do little activities with my cats um look at my plants and like cultivate them or like you know replant something because there's always something that needs to be repotted in my house um take out your sketchbook or at least if you don't feel like drawing look at an old sketchbook when you were really inspired just like little things that help refill my well that I know have worked in the past at the very least and when those techniques stop working I get to replace those things with new things in the list as I discover them and I have to change it out or else it becomes set dressing, which is my ADHD term for things that just become a part of the scenery and don't (laughs) have any meaning anymore. So I have to replace it or else it's just going to, you know, blend into the background. Um, Yeah. But like, you know, what I, what I typically try to do is just like shake myself out of it by like, okay, even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to go to the trail today. Or even if I don't feel like it, I'm going to just step outside and just like enjoy fresh air or just do anything that gets me out of the stupor. But for me, the biggest part of that stu- of shaking myself out of it is even recognizing that I'm in the stupor. So understanding your mind and your body and knowing the signs of when you're going to get in those slumps is really important. And then you can start to take steps to break it. So that's generally what I like to do. Yeah, that's really good. I'm trying. It's it's a work in progress. It always is a work in progress. It, it but. is. But I think it's important that you said too, that you have to sometimes change them out because I think after a while they do sort of become a formula that don't work on you anymore, you know? Yeah. And what, and what tends to happen too, is like when your tried and true techniques don't work, we tend to feel guilty about it because we're like, oh, like this should be working. Why is this isn't working? It's like, maybe because you're a changing human being and you have to update your techniques a little bit. That is okay you have like it's it's healthy to update your techniques so like the same things are not always going to work that's when you have to like you know work through your list and see what's going to stick this time and sometimes like it'll work in the future but you're not in the headspace for it to work and that's okay too but it's good to be in tune with what your needs are um and understanding like what your what your mind is asking you for or what your body's asking you for um you know when i was on the trail i was just walking and i was like i think i want to run right now and that's weird because i hate running but 
I was like, you know what? Like, I think my, like my body is telling me it wants to run. So I'm going to run, even if I know it's going to hurt. Cause I know I'm going to feel good later for having done it. And so I did it and I pushed myself a little bit and it felt really good. I hate running, but my body wants to run. So let it run for a little bit and let it give it that need. So it's okay to do that. Um, you know, I think that it is totally okay. If you are behind on a project, please just communicate. If, especially when you know you're hitting a wall and you can't go any further, just communicate. If you, if you're beholden to somebody, just say, Hey, is it okay if I get an extension? Is it okay if I just push it out to this thing? You don't have to even explain why it's for. Just say, hey, is it okay? Um, I'm commissioning artists now and it's already come up a few times and every single time it's come up, I'm like, yeah, that's totally fine. Please don't burn yourself out. Especially for coming from an illustrator who knows what it's like. I get so happy when people ask me for extensions because I'm like, oh good, they're taking care of themselves, thank goodness. And mm-hmm. if it's desperate and they need it, they'll let you know. Um, and if you can't do it, it could be bad or it could not be, you know, like it's, I think oftentimes we tend to catastrophize how bad something is when you can't actually do it. Yeah. And sometimes it can be bad. Sometimes it can burn bridges. Um, I've, I've just talked to a friend who said that they burned a bridge with a company, but they're doing a whole different career anyway. And ultimately it doesn't matter. Ultimately, exactly. When you zoom out far enough, you're like, it's just a job, you know? And yeah, it might seem like the end of life at that moment because you're like, how else am I going to get another thing? But it's nothing lasts forever. Not even the bad stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the dire situation is like, if, like, if this is the job is the only thing that's like between you and like not being able to feed yourself or being out on the street, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously do what you can uh, to fix it or activate your community if you have one or try to get a community if you don't have one but if you can live to fight another day if you can't get a job done and it's dire it is worth not finishing the job over you sacrificing your health yeah 100 of the time yeah there will always be another job yeah so please take care of yourselves because we really, really tend to catastrophize. I remember like panicking over things. I'm like, oh my God, I'm a day late. What's going to happen? Usually nothing. Usually it's fine. <laughs> as long and as it has been. Yeah. As long as you communicate. They, they just want, like, I mean, you're an art director, so you you can speak from this, but it's just like when when artists are afraid to talk to you or to tell you how they're struggling, like what? how do you see it from that? Because you've seen it from both sides. So I just find yeah. that interesting. Yeah. It's, you know, it's extremely frustrating when somebody is just radio silent and I'm like okay what's going on this thing was supposed to be done by now what's happening and then it prompts me to have to reach out to the artist which usually lights the fire under the butt um and be like hey what's going on is everything okay um just like checking on where the thing is and then they usually respond like oh my god I'm so sorry blah 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 and which is fine too like it's you know they're not blacklisted for that but if you make a habit of that then that's not a good look I would so much rather you say hey this is going to be delayed. Is it okay if I push it out to this date? I'm going to try to aim for this. I'm like, yeah, sure. And usually anyway, it's a plus or minus error because oftentimes when somebody's art directing a project, um, they're bouncing between a bunch of different stuff anyway. So if it doesn't come in exactly the same day that you said, it's likely usually not a problem <laughs> unless it's a hard deadline. Um, and, and I'll communicate. Yeah. yeah. And I will communicate if it's a hard deadline. Um, you know, any, any good art director or project, you know, or client or whatever will communicate that to you. Like it has to be done by this day. Um, usually like the rounds of revisions, it can be flexible around that. Like, as long as I get the final result by this time, we're good. So it is not the end of the world. If you can't finish a thing at this this exact same day, it was due. Um, I'm not encouraging you to always be late on projects, but if you are feeling like you are hit, you've hit the the worst wall, that your your physical health is suffering, your you know your wrist or shoulder or whatever is bothering you, um, and you know if you try to strain it, it's going to injure yourself further. As an art director, I would so much rather you take some time to heal, than me get the thing exactly when I asked it for. Like I I one hundred percent of the time, and maybe not all art directors are like me, but being an artist and knowing what people go through in order to try to turn things in on time, I would just just let yourself heal. Don't force it or push it. I really want, I want to see you thrive and be able to make more things. 
you can't do that if your shoulder's dangling off, you know, like you just, you can't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Rest, <laughs> let yourself be a person, yeah. please. <laughs> and yeah, use that time wisely. Like you have it, but it's obviously, like you said, don't abuse it. Like make your deadlines when you can, and then you kind of earn yourself that good cred, that you good know, will. and then you use it when you need it, but, but definitely use it. Don't be like those people that bank their sick days and, and brag. I never used a sick day. Use your sick days. Yeah. Please use your sick days. <laughs> <laughs> it's foolish not to use them. Honestly. I wish I had sick days. That sounds amazing. Yeah. They expire. Use them. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a badge of honor not to use them. <laughs> oh, no, it really is. I'm just like, Oh, I haven't taken off a day, a day off this whole year. Like why? Like that's yeah. not cute. Why? <laughs> Take your days off. I don't want to see you here every day. Go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, seriously, it's, I mean, there's so many different things that are pervasive about artists and their self-advocacy. Like mm-hmm. the, the negotiation says, question, like question is a whole thing too. Um, I know somebody in our Facebook group asked about negotiation. Um, and what to do and how to negotiate properly. Um, I can speak for both the studio perspective and the freelance perspective, but I want to hear from you. Have you had experience with negotiating your rates at all? I I mean, haven't had a lot of freelance jobs, so I've been lucky in the sense that it's, it's either been a rate that I was comfortable with or one that I'm like, oh, that's less than I'd like, but I just need that money right now, or I need that credit and it is what it is. And I didn't negotiate on that but um but yeah L- long story short I was trying to think I thought there was one but no I, I don't think I've had to at this yeah point. um yeah for the negotiation conversation specifically um because again literally anything can be negotiated and also read your contracts my friends read them when when they're sent to you if you have your own that's great I have my own contracts as well but read your contracts and make sure that like you know, you, you button up everything. It's okay to ask for revisions for a contract too. You can negotiate that as well. Um, a thing that I always negotiate for is having a revision rate mm-hmm. um, to like, you know, pass like the third, like whatever, like third revision in the final version um, that hasn't been addressed before. If revisions are still going, I charge like what, $50 an hour or whatever. Um, probably actually more than that now, um, even though I haven't done freelance in a while. Um, you can negotiate your salary get a general sense glass door is your friend get a general sense of how much that field is being paid for and get a general sense too of like what your experience looks like stacked up against that because what you want to be able to do when you negotiate is to say hey i would like this pay because i have done this being able to back it up with words is always really helpful because you're making your case you're letting the person know that you also are aware of your worth and so it makes it harder to refute and lets them know that you know what you're doing gives you more confident position to stand from so it's totally okay to do that um if it's a salary usually like plus or minus um you know like five thousand is like a good place to start if you're already kind of comfortable with the rate they're giving you if it's like way lower you can quote way more and see where they can land in between but it is very good for you to have a number that you really want to land in that you're like okay this is my absolute minimum if i get at least this i'll be good because if they go lower than that try not to compromise for it if you know that you don't want that number. Yeah. Um, and again, having leverage is always really helpful. I know that it's really hard to negotiate when you don't have anything to fall back on. So I'm keeping that in mind too. But even when you don't, oftentimes they're not just going to say no. Oftentimes they're going to counter offer with something. I have never had an experience where somebody outright said no. Even as a commissioning you know, person um, in a previous commission, not at uh, Wizards, but um, somebody quoted a rate that was like probably like 10,000 higher than what we were paying, which sounds like a lot. And I was like, well, we can't give you that, but we can give you this, which is still a pretty good rate. And they said, okay. And so I was like, okay, cool. And like, they neg- but they negotiated what they were worth. And I was like, cool. Like, I'm glad that you're doing that for yourself. We can't pay you this. We can pay you this. And that's how the, ch- the conversation usually goes. Sometimes they can, they'll outright say like, hey, like we can't, we can't afford you. Sorry. And then you can say, you can come back to them and say, well, I am willing to accept this as well. If you can't do this, then, you know, it's done. But at least you tried and they tried. But 
good point too yeah that mm-hmm. it's worth trying and that there's no shame in then accepting it if you did actually are willing to go down just to get that credit or to get the experience or whatever it is <laughs> yeah because that almost that almost happened with somebody too like I you know I was like oh like you this is too high I probably can't probably can't do this and they gave, they came back well like what would you be willing to give and I was like here this and they were like cool that's awesome we can do that it's like okay cool <laughs> that worked out yeah. so you know you you really have a lot of room to talk and work through those rates you can negotiate insurance policy you can negotiate parental leave you can negotiate sick days pto out of office whatever you can negotiate how many hours you work some people when they get a job they say hey i cannot work overtime i can't stay here past six so just letting you know that And if a studio would value you enough or would want to work with you enough, they will say, okay, we can do that. This is a part of your contract. And like, I know people who have done that and who can leave at six when everybody else is working overtime (laughs) and everybody might look at them like, uh, but everybody else could have done that too. And that's so not what was taught when I went to school. It was very much like, no, if you scare them off, if you say have all these qualifications, like who are you to call the shots? And it's like, it's so sad. Cause again, all, the only person that benefits from there is the company, not you mm-hmm. <laughs> not workers. Exactly. They don't want you to, to advocate for yourself, but if they want to work with you bad enough, they will, neg- they will work with you on your, you know, whatever accommodations you need, whatever negotiations you need. Um, you know, like if you have any disabilities, like ADHD technically is a disability. Um, if you let them know, like, Hey, I, this is how I work. Um, you know, sometimes you can even negotiate the kind of working hours you have. I think one of my studios was willing to have me work four day work week, even when everybody else was working five. And that was crazy. Like they really wanted to keep me. Um, you can negotiate that, like all these things you can negotiate, but when you're in a studio job, it's so much better when you have vouchers and when you have like a good resume to back you up but even as you're getting in you can still nego- you can negotiate anytime even when you're entry level anytime just do it but you have to have a modicum of self-worth that community will help you understand what you can even ask for same deal with freelance if you are getting a, sus- a suspiciously low rate you can be like hey this company have they have you worked with them before how much do they generally pay what is like the negotiations here? You can negotiate anything. So do it. I actually didn't know that for freelance that I, I just thought like some of these companies have these rates and they pay everybody this. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something here. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Like even outside of like wizards, I've been a client but like before. Um, and like some people ask for a certain rate and some people ask for another rate. And I was like, okay, this is what you want to be paid. This is what you want to be paid. You don't have, it does not, does not have to be a flat rate at all. There are some companies who will take a hard line and say, we can only pay this much. We're paying everybody this much, but most of the time it's variable. So yeah. ask for a rate that you're worth and they'll at least negotiate down to what they can pay you, but it's probably higher than the people who haven't negotiated at all. Yeah. And for illustration contracts, like I've actually, I guess the things I have negotiated for is just at least making sure that in the contract is that I'm allowed to sell the original art and, and prints of the piece and keep that revenue for myself because if they don't stipulate that, it's a gray area. So you want to have that in the mm-hmm. contract, you know, if I'm working traditionally. Um, but the other part is that I that I was re- misremembering was um, licensing, like different publishers around the world will charge different licensing fees right or or pay you different licensing fees so it never hurts to ask for what this other one paid you they might say no and say this is their budget but definitely ask for what the highest one was you know (laughs) yep royalties that can be negotiated um you know pay versus royalties can be negotiated um like literally like again literally anything um can be negotiated whether studio or freelance and again the worst they can do is say no. Like yeah. the worst case scenario, they walk away uh, before like letting you do it. But I've never seen that happen before. Like in my 12 years of working both freelance and studio jobs, I haven't seen that happen. So it is worth the conversation because you could really end up getting a lot much of so much of a better rate than you would have. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Please, my friends, <laughs> advocate for yourself. You are allowed to say no to things. You are allowed to ask for more. You're allowed to ask for what you're worth. And you're allowed to take care of yourself and rest. Please. 
And in the industries where it feels like hard to change that stuff, speak out because like these hashtags on Twitter that go viral inform people that have no idea that the thing they're a fan of is so badly paid. And the more people that know, the more people can advocate for you if you can't, you know? So definitely share those stories and, and help each other out as much as you can, instead of keeping that stuff, you know, behind closed doors and protecting yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. please you protect yourself by opening up the conversation exactly that's how you best protect yourself all these conversations that are happening on twitter right now the comics broke me hashtag uh has some real crazy horror stories and unbelievable things that like working conditions that people have accepted because they didn't think there was any other recourse now that the stories are being shared there's more information about it and more ideas of what can happen and what can go bad and also advice on those threads to see how you can better protect yourself and how you can better advocate for yourself. You know, this podcast is a one, it was one landing page, but there's so many other resources out there too, to help you along that path. If you love comics and you want to stick with it, just know what you're worth and know how to navigate the industry. Cause it's not an easy one. None of these industries are easy, but I want everybody to be able to have a living wage and to be able to live comfortably and to also do what they love and make what they love. So it's not easy out here, but it's possible. And the best way to do it is to just ask a little bit for help if you need it. Don't forget to ask for help, please. (laughs) But yeah, I know that this person uh, was one of the people who spurred the conversation and we don't know what the cause of death was. So we don't want to do any speculation on it or anything, but it started the conversation. So rest in peace, Ian McGinty. This was a person who I went to SCAD with uh, back in the day. And uh, he drew a portrait of me actually at a SCAD fest once. And I have that as a profile picture on Facebook. And it is really, really sad to see his passing um, at such a young age. But this conversation that has spurred out of it is something that needed to happen for a very, very long time. And it's a shame that this is what it took to have that conversation. But now that it's happening, go check it out, um, you know, join in the conversation and do what you can do to help your fellow artist not sign up for conditions that are not good enough for them. Take care of each other, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>